Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to the South of Star Wars Public Library, the front room of the community, and we know how comfortable you all are here, and we're comfortable having you here with us. Uh, thanks for being friends of the library. Thanks for supporting the library. If I, I'm doing a little bit of housekeeping here at the beginning, uh, I know you come to talk to me, but, to me. but if you're a uh, resident of the town, please remember to come to town meeting in May and support the library and the other initiatives that will be on the warrant. Um, happy to be uh, in the warrant once again and supported so far by the select board and the warrant committee. <coughs> so, um, if you aren't already on our e-newsletter sign-up list, when you're in the library sometime, go to the circulation desk, make sure you're on the e-news. That way you find about all the kind of wonderful things like Carl uh, that are planned upcoming. And I will emphasize just two. The 21st, there will be our next tea. We've been having monthly teas here in this room over the dark months, which are now getting brighter with the time change. So it will be March, April, and May, I believe. So watch for those. It's a wonderful time to just chat and enjoy some wonderful home-baked goodies and some wonderful hot tea. And then on May, March 26th, Jane Potter will be here talking about her book with her uh, illustrated talk on It Ended with a Wedding. Um, and then with, pay attention to the summer, the remainder of spring and summer schedule, lots of wonderful things coming Nizel Hall musicians will be back again in July. <clears throat> um, the book sale will be in July over Flamingo Festival weekend. The art auction will be up at the end of June and through uh, August, end of July and through August. Um, and that's a fun thing in a way to celebrate the creativity all around us. And today, and this month of March, we're celebrating Women's History Month. So while you're in the building or come back and spend some time with the displays from here and all down the halls and upstairs of women being celebrated by women creators in our midst, the theme is um, women who advocate for equity, inclusion, and diversity. So it's a thrill to be in any presence of Carl Little and his <laughs> wonderful, warm <laughs> interpretation of the art around us. Um, he's a great library friend, and we, we relish the opportunity to celebrate him whenever we can. He's, uh, he's much in demand, so we always think it's a privilege that Carl will find time to be with us. Um, he and his brother, you know, have written books about the art of Acadia, the paintings of Portland, Maine, which has a Portland, Maine, Manjoy Hill kit, I really enjoyed celebrating that and having my own copy. But beyond that work and their collaboration, Carl's the author of 30 books. And then his byline is almost everywhere you turn. He's in Art New England. Hyper, hyper allergic. I didn't know what that was, and I looked it up today. Look up hyper, hyper allergic. It's an interesting <laughs> website and blog. Maine Boats, Homes, and Harbors. Island Journal and Working Waterfront. Come on in and ornament. Uh, and I looked at that today. I never heard of ornament before. So it's really wonderful celebrations of the creativity of all kinds. And Carl's got his finger on the pulse of so many of those disciplines and those creative folks. So two other housekeeping things, and then I'll get out of the way. Carl, um, there will be time for questions and answers at the end. Carl has books available here for sale, and the library is equipped to handle your transaction electronically um, with a piece of plastic or that old-fashioned green stuff. We, could, we can help you with all of that. So please, take advantage uh, of taking home and having time to spend with your in your own homes with this wonderful new book that Carl's going to take us a journey on. So without further ado, settle in. We're going to take a sail around to Mouskit Bay. We're going to visit its, its inlets, its islands, its coves, its peninsulas. Nothing gives me greater pleasure than welcoming Carl Little. Thank you. I want to hit the lights here because. Oh, I'm, I'm looking to do that. No? So, welcome everyone. 
Uh, thanks to the library and its terrific team for the invitation to offer a sampler from the latest Little Brothers publication, Art of Penobscot Bay. I'm delighted to be presenting this talk amidst another terrific exhibition here at the library. Hats off to this world of books for welcoming art to its walls. Art of Penobscot Bay is David's and my fourth collaboration following books on the art of Acadia, Katahdin, and Portland. Slowly but surely, we're covering the state. This one was among the most daunting, about a thousand images whittled down to 134 by 120 artists. We did a lot of hunting and gathering, research and outreach over the better part of a year. Are you hearing a little scratching? Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna pull it away. I'm gonna pull this away. Let's try it again. How's that? Better. Better? I, uh, I still hear a little. Shame. Testing? <laughs> Hello, testing, testing. Better. 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 Okay, there Thank we go. You. Uh, and then, then for a better part of the year, then we made our selections. There was some horse trading and compromise. <laughs> I'm gonna pull it back. <laughs> for example, David insisted on one photograph, a gorgeous Elliot Porter of Grace oh. Bruce Head Island, and he also lobbied for a group of vintage postcards. So those are in there. <laughs> and he also once again suggested we include some maps to help orient the reader to the region. The cover painting is a bird's eye view of North Haven by Amy Peters Wood, Coming Home, 2021, Egg Tempera, a welcoming invitation to enter the book. One of the first things David and I did was try to figure out the width, length, and breadth of Penobscot Bay. <laughs> we got some help from the Island Institute in Rockland. Mm -hmm. Penobscot Bay is Maine's largest bay, Philip Conkling and his team write in the landmark book, Islands in Time, mm -hmm. measuring 20 miles across from Whitehead to Ilaho and trending 30 miles north to the mouth of the equally good, to, to the equally grand river of the same name. The bay, they note, encompasses almost 1,000 miles of shoreline and encircles 624 islands and ledges. And they brag, Penobscot Bay is the second largest embayment on the Atlantic coast of the United States after Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> Lots of ground and water to cover. In addition to several maps, we included one of Molly Brown's renderings of the bay. Her image, a monoprint with watercolor added, has an as seen from space feeling, the land and water scattered like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. This is Penobscot Bay 2019. And I recommend, she has a wonderful website and she has a company called Molly Maps and she does a lot of this, this kind of work. We stretched the boundaries a bit. After all, a bay is fluid. The northernmost image in the book is this Judy Taylor view of Bucksport as viewed from the Penobscot Narrows Bridge Observatory. This is her Bucksport from the Penobscot Narrows Bridge, 2012, and oil on linen. Writer Genevieve Morgan, whom some of you may know as a seasonal Southwest Harbor resident, took us on at Island Port Press, something of a leap of faith as they had never produced an art book. In addition to serving as chief curator, Morgan lined up the writer Peter Nichols to write a foreword. In his appreciative text, he writes, when people think of Maine, particularly regarding paintings they have seen, they are probably seeing in their imagination Penobscot Bay. It is here that many of Maine's artists have come to paint. There's a primeval quality on view here. Those huge granite rocks everybody paints, the detritus of glacial moraine, the dense, unscarred pelt of fir trees, all appears unchanged for eons. Only the windmills rising above Vinyl Haven Island in Annalise Scar's Three Turbines, 2018, would not be recognized by early voyagers and visitors who found sustenance in the waters of Penobscot Bay. I might note that David and I relish the opportunity to bring visibility to a wide range of artists past and present. Every survey book project like Art of Penobscot Bay results in many discoveries. This is one of them, uh, uh, Annalise Scar. I recommend you look up her work, she's remarkable. And this actually, this painting brings to mind uh, one of Chris Van Dusen's most recent children's books, 
uh, Big Truck, Little Island. The book is based on an incident on Vinyl Haven where a truck hauling part of a wind turbine blocked an island road for the better part of the day. David and I wanted to connect the bay to the Penobscot River. This painting by James Eric Francis, Director of Cultural and Historic Preservation for the Penobscot Nation, provided the perfect link. Francis was one of three indigenous artists commissioned by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Museum and Archives to create art for its permanent collection. His contribution, Atlantic Salmon, was inspired by the removal of dams from the Penobscot River watershed, the addition of fish passages, and the subsequent return of sea-run fish. For me, Francis says, Letting nature be how nature is supposed to be is the ultimate place to go. The painting serves, in Francis's words, to welcome home the salmon, with each dot representing one fish. The fishing spear, he notes, this, 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 this object, he notes, is the cultural connection between his tribe and the salmon. David was very keen on having some ship paintings in the book, so we turned to the Penobscot Marine Museum for help in Searsport. We ended up with a half dozen paintings from their collection, including this one by Waldo Pierce. Pierce imagined what Carver Shipyard in Searsport might have looked like with the namesake ship, the John Carver, on the ways. The painting includes details related to shipbuilding, including stacks of barrel staves and various structures, among them the steam shed and the oakum and blacksmith's shops. This is Waldo Pierce Carver Yard with the John Carver on the waves, on the ways, 1960 oil on canvas. We also drew on the Farnsworth Art Museum's outstanding collection of main art, including this stunning watercolor by Charles Copeland. Born in Thomaston, Maine, Copeland was known for marine paintings and seascapes, as well as book illustrations. This early 1900s watercolor of a wave-swept, seaweed-draped rock off remote Creehaven, also known as Ragged Island, testifies to his brilliant handling of the notoriously unruly medium. This is uh, Copeland's Creehaven, circa 1910, watercolor. I had already written about some of the paintings in the book, including this one by George Lukes in an article in the Island Journal about members of the Ashcan School painting in Maine. I'm pleased to note that this is the first time Luke's has appeared in a survey of Maine art. Luke's painted Poverty Hump, a small weather-beaten outpost in the Muscle Ridge Shoals off South Thomason during his one very productive summer in Maine in 1922. In an interview that year with a reporter from the Portland Evening Press, the painter waxed lyrical about his surroundings. He said, Talk about the chalk cliffs of Cornwall. Talk about the wonderful scenery anywhere in Europe. Maine has it over them. Here you have that wonderful glory that is found only in such a climate as that of Maine. And your rocks and shores are so rugged and bold. They make other rocks and shores seem petty and, and pretty in comparison. And your characters, there are real American types here, <laughs> types that you find nowhere else. Now that's an endorsement. <laughs> this is George Luke's uh, Poverty Hump, Maine, 1922 from the Chrysler Museum of Art in Norfolk, Virginia. We got to see this last year in the flesh, as it were. The history of American art is reflected in the book, including American Impressionism by way of the paintings of Frank Benson and others. According to Peabody Essex Museum Director Dean Lai Kanan, when Benson's images of a pretty genteel life drew criticism for being portraits of the wealthy and privileged, the painter turned to nature and birds replaced the women and children as his objects of interest. I should note um, that this is interesting that the Wendell Gillies uh, Museum summer show uh, titled Inspired Flight Treasures from the Museum of American Bird Art at Mass Audubon features several paintings by, by Benson. This is his Osprey and Fish, 1924. American modernism arrived in Maine in the early 1900s when John Marin, 
and other painters started their forays along the coast in search of subject matter. Marin had exhibited paintings in the landmark Armory Show in New York City in 1913, which introduced many viewers to modern European art and shocked them by its new visions of what art might look like. Marin came to Stonington in the 1920s and immediately took a shine to the place. Some of the views with innumerable islands are bully, he wrote to his friend, New York City dealer, champion of modernist painters and pioneering photographer, Alfred Stieglitz. This place has got me by the nape of the neck, he wrote in another letter. Once I get here, I forget other places, which is a failing I have that I am perfectly aware of. <laughs> this is uh, Marin's pertaining to Stonington Harbor, Maine, number one, 1926, watercolor from the Philadelphia Museum of Art's Alfred Stieglitz collection. Another member of Stieglitz's stable, Marston Hartley, began his painting life in his home state of Maine and then returned after spending time in New York, the Southwest, Mexico, and Europe. Living an itinerant life, he drifted around Maine with stays in Georgetown, Bangor, Korea, and West Brooksfield. Hartley spent the summer of 1939 in the latter village at Bagadoo's Farm. While exploring the area, he came upon a log jam near the confluence of the Bagadoos River and Penobscot Bay. A forthright expression, representation of flotsam and jetsam, a shoe, a barrel, and a lobster trap mixed with the clustered logs. Hartley's painting also documents an element of Maine's lumber industry. As George Wasson noted in his 1932 book, Sailing Days on the Penobscot, logs often escaped from river drives and ended up on the shores of the bay, at times creating a navigational hazard. This is his log jam, Penobscot Bay, 1940, uh, from the Detroit Institute of Arts. And I wanted to mention that the Bates College Museum, under the guidance of Hartley Authority, Gail Scott, is developing a catalog resume of the Lewiston-born painter. And you can see some of the work that's already been done on, on the Bates Museum uh, website under the, under the title, Marston Hartley Legacy Project. It's just wonderful what they're doing. Fairfield Porter spent a part of nearly every summer for 30 years on Great Spruce Head Island in the middle of Penobscot Bay. After his father, James Porter, a businessman and amateur naturalist from Illinois, purchased the 280-acre island in 1912, the family embraced it as a kind of northern Eden, a place that offered freedom to explore and grow and paint. Porter practiced what has come to be called painterly realism, marked by loose, expressive brushstroke. He often turned to friends and family for subjects, as in this painting, a tennis game, 1973, that documents the leisure and joy by summer islanders. When they built, a, this is kind of interesting note, when they built a concrete tennis court on Grace Spruce Head Island during World War I, Suspicious neighbors thought it was a secret gun emplacement. <laughs> <laughs> this is Fairfield Porter's the Tennis Game, uh, 1972, from the Lauren Rogers Museum in Laurel, Mississippi, uh, which leads me to say that David handled the permissions for nearly all of the paintings in the book, uh, the, the historical paintings, which is really no mean feat when you consider some of the hoops and barrels museums and other institutions require you to navigate. A contemporary of Porter, my uncle, William Keenbush, started painting in Maine and Penobscot Bay in the 1940s. He spoke of his work as, quote, a translation, a language to communicate a world. Influenced by abstract expressionism and his heroes, Hartley, Marin, and Arthur Dove, Keenbush brought new energy to Maine subjects including islands, bell buoys, seagrass, and ledges. Once the home of a granite quarry industry and now part of the Outward Bound School, Hurricane Island was Keenbush's favorite place in Maine. He would hire a lobster boat on Vinyl Haven, a lobsterman on Vinyl Haven to drop him off for the day so that he could wander the abandoned island taking photos with his brownie camera and making quick drawings to use as props for paintings back in his uh, summer digs and, and also in his New York studio. He likened the experience to a dream, an epiphany of nature, as art historian Donaldson Hoops put it, 
writing about Kimush's first visit to the island in 1951. This is his Across Pine, Across Four Pines, Hurricane Island, 1956, from the um, Smithsonian American Art Museum. Stephen Pace had a home and studio in Stonington. Like Kingbush, Pace felt the liberating force of abstract expressionism. But in the end, he used large brushes, big canvases, and fast, forceful gestures to turn that energy to representational subjects, wishing to transform but not relinquish reality. Stonington is one of the most active lobstering ports in the world. Captivated by the bustle, Pace frequented the town's waterfront, the docks, and the lobster co-op. When he and his wife Pam moved back to his boyhood home in northern Indiana later in life, they donated their home in Stonington to the Maine College of Art as a residency and gallery to ensure its continued use as an artistic haven. This is his uh, Stephen Pace's leaving co-op here, 1990 oil. To paint this view of Camden, Fred Scherer turned to pointillism, a 19th century French style of painting using small dots of color and patterns. Scherer, who was celebrated for his dioramas, uh, he helped for the dioramas he helped create for the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, retired to Friendship, Maine in the 1970s. There, he painted local scenes while serving as a consultant at, at the Maine State Museum in Augusta, where he became a mentor to, to Gary Hoyle, former curator of natural history who now lives and paints on Swan's Island. Some of you may know Gary. This is Fred Scherer's Camden Rooftops, 2002. The today section of Art of Penobscot Bay begins at the outer edge of Penobscot Bay and the island that guards it. Metinicus. From the Abenaki language, the name means far out island, a fitting description, as Metinicus has the distinction of being the farthest inhabited territory off the east coast of the United States. Sam Cady, also from Friendship, Maine, took advantage of a friend's cottage to spend a week drawing, photographing, and, quote, make soaking the island in. On a walk to the far shores, he was struck by the breakwater, <clears throat> the chaos and order of it, every granite shape different with drill marks providing evidence of construction, plus, quote, the beauty of light, shape, color, texture. His shape canvas, and this is a shape canvas, so this is the edge of the canvas. Oh. Going, going around it. Um, <laughs> offers a dramatic view of what he calls a symbol of protection and collective power for good use. This is Metinicus 2000 oil on shape canvas from the Farnsworth Art Museum. This painting by David Sears, a summer resident of Metinicus Island, carries a special message. To the light we gathered as a community was prompted by the death of Penobscot Island air pilot Don Campbell as he attempted to land on Metinicus on October 5th, 2011. Campbell's plane was knocked from the air by a fierce wind. In the wake of the crash, the islanders gathered as a community as Sears stenciled on his painting to mourn Campbell. In a style reminiscent of Jasper Johns and Robert Indiana, he created a stunning memorial with the island in the center. This is To the Light We Gathered as a Community, 2011 acrylic. And it's actually, the painting's actually owned by Eva Murray, who's owned for many years has been kind of the voice of Matinicus Island. Uh, a, a wonderful, she was a teacher out there too. And I did want to mention that uh, David Sears also creates incredible birds. We had one in the avian artistry show at the Wendell Gilly last summer. And you, you've, got to, you've got to check them out. They're, they're, they're really remarkable. <laughs> Painter Irene Olivieri lived for a year or so in the keeper's quarters at the Marshall Point Lighthouse. The popular tourist site draws many visitors and the painter sometimes felt put upon. <laughs> After a lobsterman gave her a ride out on Penobscot Bay one day and she found herself surrounded by forested islands and all manner of wildlife, Olivieri fantasized setting up a studio in an old lobster boat. <laughs> on a hot summer day, she writes, 
I could take breaks by swimming with the seals and no one would come knocking on my studio door. Her studio of the sea fulfills this delightful vision. This is Studio of the Sea 2019. Some of you may have, uh, have, 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 been, um, have met, met Irene during her very too short residence on the Cape Road in West Fremont a few years ago. While I'm sorry she moved to Santa Fe, I can report that she is painting like mad and has found a whole new assortment of wild creatures to celebrate. <laughs> there, were, there was bound to be a few lighthouses in the book. Watercolorist Paul Rickard <clears throat> made his seasonal home in Maine for nearly a half century. Elliot Porter's book, Summer Island, about Grace Spruce Head Island, factored into his decision to move to Brooksville. From there, he roamed the coast, paints in hand, ready to respond to a scene at a moment's notice. He relished the architecture of Maine, which included the Owl's Head Coast Guard Station that's, that is located below the lighthouse. Some of you may remember uh, seeing some of Paul's luminous paintings at the Wingsprout Gallery in Northeast Harbor back in the day. Mm -hmm. Paul passed away last year, a great loss to the Maine art world, of which he was a passionate part. From Rockland, ferries depart for several Penobscot Bay Islands, including Matinicus, North Haven, and Vinyl Haven. Bucksport resident Sam Minot, whose family has deep roots on North Haven, provides a head-on view of the island car ferry, the Captain Neil Burgess. This painting hangs behind Maine representative and North Haven Re Islander Shelley Pingree's desk in her Washington, D.C. office. This is a North Haven Ferry by Sam Minot, 2004 oil. My paintings, writes Wiscasset based painter Seaver Leslie, generally celebrate local culture and traditions. His watercolor J.O. Brown Boatyard, North Haven, 2013, pays tribute to a legacy of wooden boat building. Owned and run by the same family who began it, the boatyard has built lobster boats, launches, and sailing vessels for well over a century. The craft made there are, in his words, archetypal designs that have existed on Maine waters for centuries, <laughs> which puts the boats and the builders in harmony with the past and present, land and sea. This is uh, Leslie's The J.O. Brown Boatyard, North Haven, 2012. And I just want to note that I, I have a kind of an extended riff on this painting in the, in the current issue of the working waterfront. <laughs> Watercolorist Linda Norton spent her childhood summers in her grandparents' home in Camden. There she learned how to, to row, to read the tides, where the fish were biting and where to pick mussels off the pilings, she recalled in a remembrance published in 2010. And there were art lessons. Her mother taught her how to paint and draw starting at age six. When she returned to Camden as a professional painter later in life, Norton focused on the busy harbor painting meticulous watercolors of various sailing vessels drawn to their riggings, curves, and contours. Roseway Reflections pays homage to the quiet and majesty of the iconic schooner Roseway, which was built in 1925 as a racing vessel and now is home to the World Ocean School. This is uh, Roseway Reflections, 1999 watercolor. Moving to Camden from Brooklyn, New York, 20 or so years ago, Colin Page was introduced to the culture of boating, fishing, and exploring the coast by sailboat. As he settled in, Page painted the working waterfront and views of the harbor and bay from the Camden Hills. When he took up sailing, he discovered a fresh perspective and new painting territory. Columns was prompted by a visit to Dix Island, which once boasted a thriving granite quarry and where remnants of the work of European stoneworkers can still be found. This is Page's Columns, 2020, in oil. In his early years, the 1950s in Lincolnville, Alex Katz often turned to the local scene for inspiration. On summer sojourns from New York City, this forerunner of pop art always practiced a simplified aesthetic, reducing elements of the landscape to those, to their essence. In his clam diggers at Duck Trap, 1956, two men raked the flats for surf clams. 
their motion seemingly choreographed against the bay and Camden Hills beyond. Katz once noted that painting plein air at the Scalvegan School of Painting and Sculpture back in 1949 <coughs> gave him, quote, a reason to devote my life to painting. This is uh, Clam Digger's set, Duck Track 1956 from the Coley College Museum of Art. Belfast-based painter Allison Rector specializes in interiors, the light entering <coughs> rooms and buildings, she writes. While working on paintings for an exhibition, How the Light Gets In, the title references line of a famous Leonard Cohen song, Rector visited a friend's cottage in the Bayside neighborhood of Northport to do some sketching. The view from inside caught her eye, the piano, the cool light falling from the wraparound porch, the blue of Penobscot Bay. It was springtime, she writes, a time for sweeping out the winter dust and readying for summer. This is uh, Rector's Spring Sweeping, 2017. Painter A. Goodale's great-great-grandfather was Charles Dana Gibson, Today, Goodale paints in his forebear studio on 700-acre island off the southern end of Islesboro, but the subjects are quite different. Where the Gibson girls represented ideal women with perfected, perfectly coiffed hair, Goodale's portraits of fishermen, which he started painting in 2016, are true to life. In the watercolor Pause 2018, the lobster boat captain stands at the starboard gunnel looking aft to his sternman while resting his gloved hands on traps to either side. In all his portraits, Goodale seeks to pay tribute to the stalwart individuals behind this, quote, thriving yet fragile industry. This is a uh, pause 2018 watercolor. Wandering around Belfast one day, Bangor-based painter Jeff Locksterkamp encountered an unusual group of sculptures set in the old cribbing remains of a shipbuilding pier in the harbor. The work of popular Belfast chainsaw sculptor Ron Cowan, the elongated faces carved from wood emerge at low tide, hence their name, the Long Breath. Gloucester <laughs> Camp's Guardians of Belfast shows several of the figures, their gnarled visages staring this way and that, painting them fulfills the painter's professional goal, professed goal, to draw the viewer into other worlds. In this case, a real but fantastic sight on the main coast, uh, Guardians of Belfast by Jeff Lobster Camp, 2014, and oil. John Moore's painting, Wharf, also edges into another world. This comp composite view, he explains, is based on a public walkway that runs past the Front Street shipyard in Belfast, while the framing window comes from his former studio in the Globe Dye Factory in Philadelphia. Moore noted how everything in his paintings is real, or should have been real, or could be real, <laughs> adding, that's the only rule, it could be real. <laughs> I do want to mention that uh, I'm currently working on a monograph of uh, John Moore's work that will be published by Courthouse Gallery next fall. <clears throat> the Von Jaquette's bird's eye view of the Belfast <clears throat> waterfront is precise in its details, from the individual buildings that line Main Street to the various boats in the harbor. The painter, who divided her year between New York City and Searsmont, sometimes chartered planes and helicopters to fly her over chosen spots along the main coast. In a style that sometimes bears kinship to precisionist and pointillist art, she transforms the landscape below by way of shifting planes of paint strokes. This is her waterfront of Belfast, Maine, 1990, oil on canvas. And uh, we, we, we lost Jack Jaquette last year, another greatly missed artist who, who, who deeply loved Maine. Gregory Dunham's inventory of watercolor views of Castine includes Eaton's Boatyard. Even as he rues the loss of working waterfront buildings in Castine, Dunham notes how the boatyard, one of the last remaining structures of its kind, offers him, quote, almost endless possibilities for painting. In front of the building site, a Castine-class a Castine -class sailboat designed and built by the Eaton family. This is uh, Eaton's Boatyard, 
Gregory Dunn, 2015. Anina Porter Fuller is the niece of painter Fairfield Porter and his brother photographer Elliot Porter. Every summer she hosts a gathering of artists and writers at the Porter House, the big house on the Great Spruce Head Island, carrying forth the legacy of her uncles. Her game of chess 2020 blends interior and exterior and features family. Two figures, her grandsons are focused on their contest while her son and daughter-in-law prepare to explore the island outside. This is a game of chess, Anita, Anina Porter Fuller, 2020. Through her residency, Fuller has introduced Grace Cruz Head Island and surrounding islands to a host of painters, including the Stockton Springs-based painter, Sarah Farragher. In 2004, while visiting Grace Cruz Head, Farragher explored nearby Bear Island, former home of Buckminster Fuller. Con conversing with an islander, she learned of Birch Lodge, a humble dwelling that could be rented in June. Invited to consider this option, Farragher soon found herself taking up annual summer residence in the middle of Penobscot Bay for painting supplies at the ready. She wrote a wonderful autobiography of an island, a memoir uh, in 2022 that, 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 that covers her time on the island. This is uh, Afternoon Shadows, Bear Island, Maine, uh, 2010 oil on canvas. Among the most painted views on the coast of Maine, Caterpill, Caterpillar Hill in Sedgwick <coughs> offers a panoramic view of Penobscot Bay. You can tell we're sort of moving up east and coming around the top yeah, on, in the home stretch. Lawrence Moffat heads there every fall from his longtime home in Deer Isle, looking for the intense reds of wild blueberry plants, he told me. His pastel Caterpillar Hill color includes glimpses of Walker's Pond, Igamaga Reach, Penobscot Bay Islands, and the Camden Hills. This is Caterpillar Hill Color 2021 Soft Pastel. And uh, this is one case where I, I didn't know Moffitt's work at all before I started assembling the book. And he's just one of many wonderful discoveries. Susan Webster knows about connecting to place. For many years, she and her husband, the poet Stuart, Stuart Kestenbaum and their two sons spent weekends during the fall on Sheephead Island, just off Sylvester Cove in the village of Sunset in Deer Isle in East Penobscot Bay. In the daytime, she recalled, we harvested mussels, walked trails, explored beaches, and, and napped on the deck and porch. At night, we cooked, ate by candlelight, played board games, read by the gaslight lamps, and slept with windows open to the lulling sound of the ocean's constant movement. Time stood still. Webster's favorite beach faced northwest, where the view included Vinyl Haven, North Haven, the Porcupines, and Eagle, and Butter Islands, encircled overhead by cumulus clouds and surrounded by scattered, scattering light of the yellow, blue, and green sea, she endeavored to discover, to document the breadth of it, the experience of the wind and sea in my eyes, the smell of the seaweed, the desire to become a part of this island life and to record the sweetness of being alive. This is uh, Susan Webster's view from Sheephead Island, Deer Isle, Maine, 2008, a pastel. Oops, far away. I think that's right. Finnish born painter Vino Kola moved to Deer Isle in 1995 upon retiring from his longtime teaching position at Wheaton College in Norton, Mass. His landscapes have a cool quality, the palette tuned to northern hues. In an often chaotic, violent, troubling world, there's a clear need for art, he told critic Christian Andresen in a 2006 interview, adding, it touches our soul, reminds us who we are, and helps us regain our center. His paintings testify to the truth of those words. This is Cola's Causeway Tidal Flats. 2006 oil on canvas. In his year summary on Deer Isle, Howard Fussner 
often painted the 4th of July parade drawn to the colorful spectacle of neighbors filling the streets. In 2004, the town honored famed Maine children's book author Robert McCloskey with a special procession. According to the author's son, Saul, the floats referenced McCloskey's various books, including Make Way for Ducklings, One Morning in Maine, and Bert Dow, Deep Water Man. <laughs> this is a parade, Howard Fusner Parade for Robert McCloskey, 2004. Jill Hoy grew up in Deer Isle in the 1960s and has lived part of the year in Stonington for many years. <coughs> Choreography, 2009, responds to a performance directed by Allison Chase, one of the founders of the Palabalus Dance Company, held in the Oceanville Quarry, which looks out on Ila Ho. Commissioned by the Stonington Opera House, the piece featured all manner of equipment for suspending dancers over the granite landscape. <coughs> Hoy populated the crowd with family and friends. It was, she stated, a once in a lifetime commemoration of pure human magic and the power of creation. This is Hoy's choreography, 2009, oil on canvas. Stonington is one of the busiest lobster fishing ports in New England. Belfast painter Susan Toby White series, Lobster and Women of Maine, includes a portrait of Genevieve MacDonald, who once captained the fishing vessel, vessel Hello Darlings 2 out of Stonington. MacDonald was the first main, first female commercial fisherman elected to the Maine House of Representatives, covering all island district 134, stretching from the Cranberry Isles to the Marshall Island Township. This is uh, Susan Toby White, Lobstering Women of Maine, Genevieve, 2018. There's actually a wonderful book of hers, of, her, of, of uh, White's paintings of Maine's lobstering women. Stonington boasts an annual lobster boat race in July. The Scottish born painter William Urban, who lives in Brooklyn, Maine, depicts the contest by way of two lobster boats crossing the canvas in parallel lines, leaving straight white wakes behind them. There's a looseness and energy in the impasto surface that seems to fit the tub deck perfectly. This is his lobster boat race, Stonington, 2012, in oil. A passion for place marks David Vickery's painting of the head of, May of Moore's Harbor on the western side of Ila Ho. In cool tones and with a precise brush, the Cushing-based painter celebrates a still cove where the seas from the southwest have created a large gravel bar. At lower tides, Vickery reports, this creates elegant shapes in the water, which along with the, with the boathouse, wharf remnants, and glacial boulders made for, a, made for a painting that practically designed itself. This is his Moore's Harbor, Ilaho, 2016. And I may mention that Vickery studied with Ernie McMullen at COA many, many years ago. And finally, we finished the trip around the bay with Diana Roper McDowell's watercolor, Victory Chimes, passing Ilaho, 2019. McDowell has loved the historic schooner since she saw it as a kid. Later, staying in a cabin on Saddleback Island in Merchant Row, she watched it sailing by, took a few photos, and decided to paint it. In her geometric style, she transforms the three-masted gap-rigged ship into a dynamic image of Maine coast sailing. It's a classic form in a classic landscape. This is uh, Victory Chimes, Passing Ilaho, 2019, watercolor. McDowell's painting reflects the past, present, and future of Penobscot Bay, while it hark ba harks back to the glory days of tall ships and schooners. It also reflects the current catering to visitors who seek to experience Penobscot Bay from the water. As for the future, we sail on, not knowing exactly what we'll encounter around the next island. Thank you. Questions? What are the 39 steps? <laughs> I don't know.
Oh, there we go. Yes. James. Hi. Um, how that, oh, hi. I, I just have a specific question about a specific painting. Sure. And now I can't remember the person's name, the Finnish person. Vino Cola. Vino. Um, how big is that painting? Is it really big? It's quite large, yeah. 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 I think I've seen other work by him. Yeah, he's, he's brilliant. It's stunning. Yeah. He shows at the Turtle Gallery in Deer Isle. And, uh, right. Yeah, just just incredible. He's also a great winter painter. You know, he does those paintings where you feel like you, you should put on a sweater when you're looking at them. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm always worried about the people that I left out. And so I, I'm always willing to take that criticism. <laughs> a question back here? No. I just wanted to um, be reminded of the person that you said painted the Robert McCloskey parade. Yeah, Howard Fussner, F U S S I N E R. Wonderful painter. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Now, you can pass to Mary. So, um, I, I think your choice of paintings is very interesting and eclectic. Um, very few people in the paintings, uh, no actual portraits, like Alex Katz was known for that, the wise. You know, could you just comment on why there are so few people in these paintings? Well, there are more uh, once you get into the book, uh, <coughs> I'm happy to say, uh, but it really, um, I don't know. I, th I think we, we wanted a mix of things, um, and it's so well known for its landscapes that that was going to that was going to be the dominant subject of the book. Um, but I, I I do like where we did manage to to squeak in some that that choreography painting by Jill Hoy is just a blast. I mean, it's just all kinds of stuff going on there. I wish I could have seen that performance. Uh, uh, Allison Chase has done some wonderful work in dance performance in this area uh, over the years, including the Stonington area. Um, but yeah, that's uh, there are some in there, <laughs> uh, but uh, there wasn't anything. There wasn't. I think we were really looking for variety, uh, and, and you can see that. I mean, the styles are so so diverse. I mean, one of my favorite paintings is the is Irene Olivieri's of her swimming with the seal. I mean, it just it gives me joy. Uh, but it's it's very different from anything else in the book. Uh, um, and then you know there are a couple of creatures. We have that wonderful painting of the osprey by Frank Benson, and uh, so it's really you know trying to mix it up as best we can. Uh, so, question here. What's Susan's name down in Belfast, her last name? Uh, Susan Toby White. Wait, I, I was lucky enough to go on a group tour of her studio, which is very small and very filled with her portraits of women lobster, lobstermen. Um, and being with how it's Women's History Month and Women's Month, it's a great time to go down there and see all, all the female uh, uh, lost in my shapes, um, bearing homage to. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, there's a wonderful book of all of those yes. portraits. And yes. There was a show yeah. at the Penobscot Marie Museum a yeah. number years ago. But lucky you, I would like to go, go see those. I'll get the microphone, Kate, and I'll have to keep running that. Who's next? Oh, look out. It's one of my neighbors. Oh. Surprises. 
Well, that's the one that I mentioned, Lawrence Moffat, who lives on Deer Isle. I love his work. His work Pascal. I hadn't, I hadn't really I hadn't really known it, so I was really delighted to be able to give a little shout out. Yeah. But yeah, plenty of surprises. Um, yeah. Sorry, we're all family. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming. Really. <laughs>